Thank you for ministering to us in music today. We're going to look in the gospel according to St. Luke. Luke chapter 1. I'm going to begin in verse 26. As you find it, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for your word to us today. May your spirit speak it into our hearts and lives. And may you anoint this time of preaching as we hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's how every one of the movies began. That 40 years ago, you saw it blazoned on the screen for the very first movie that came out in the original trilogies. 22 years later, with the prequel trilogies, you saw it start the very same way. And now with the second movie in the last trilogy, you will see it emblazoned on the screen once again. A long time ago, in a Galilee far, far away. And some of you are saying, you're laughing because I've got it wrong, don't I? I'm, I'm off by one word. And the movie was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It's a shame, you know, that George Lucas had it off by that one word. Because you see, as great as those Star Wars movies are, they miss by one word telling the greatest story of all time. You see, when you change that one word, it leads you directly to a young virgin a long time ago living far, far away in the town of Nazareth, located in the region called Galilee. And unlike Star Wars, the story that begins in Galilee is absolutely true. And it is a story that has changed the world. It is a story that can change you. It began six months after Elizabeth conceived. Elizabeth would become the mother of the person we know as John the Baptist. And six months after John's conception, an angel by the name of Gabriel was sent by God to a certain virgin named Mary. According to Jewish tradition, Mary would be about 13 years old. You see, we are told that she was betrothed to a man named Joseph. Now, the translation that I read, and many of our translations will say that, that she was engaged. They say that because we understand engagement. We do not understand betrothal. But uh, there, there's a bit of a difference between the two. In Jewish tradition of that day, a betrothal would take place for a girl at about the age of 13. And when that happened, for legal purposes, she was considered to be married. But for about a year-long period, she would remain at her father's home with her family while her husband would prepare his home. And about a year later, he would come and take her to his home, to their home, to 
to be together, and normal married life would begin at that time. So sexual relations did not take place until the beginning of that normal married period. This is at the setting where we find Mary. In our society, the, the idea of virginity until marriage has become almost a mockery by many. It, it certainly, it's it seen as kind of an oddity. But church, I want to tell you, it is God's good design for us to remain sexually pure until after a man and woman enter into holy matrimony where they pledge themselves exclusively to each other. You see, God has created the gift of sex to be more than just physical pleasure. But as the scriptures tell us, it is God's design that the two shall become one flesh. As Dan Boone has said, sex leaves an indelible imprint on the soul of another person. And the stamp of that other person becomes a part of who you are. And so when we engage in sexual relations outside of marriage, as our culture celebrates, we are attaching ourselves to someone to whom we do not intend to stay bound. We are experiencing bonding and breaking, using and leaving, holding and walking away. But not so with Mary. And, and because of this, the angel is able to say to her, Greetings favored one, the Lord is with you. Or more traditionally, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Again in verse 30, the angel will tell Mary that she has found favor with God. Back on December the 6th, on Wednesday, we at the church remembered, observed the feast day of St. Nicholas. And, and during that time, I said that the reason that the church observes those kinds of days and focuses, remembers the saints, whether they're the, the saints found in the scripture or the saints found throughout history, or, or even whenever we recall people like maybe our grandparents who have been saints within the church. The reason that we do that is because they show us how to live in a way that reflects God. St. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate him. And Mary uniquely becomes one to whom we can look. Like Noah, Moses, and David before her, Mary is said to have found favor with God. Like Gideon, she is told that the Lord is with her. Can I tell you, I want to find favor with God. Don't you? I, I want it to be said of me that the Lord is with me. That should be our heart's desire. Sometimes we in, um, in Protestant circles get a little defensive because we have some brothers and sisters who seem to take admiration of Mary a, a little too far so that for them, it seems that she rivals Jesus, who alone is worthy of praise, honor, and adoration. And yet sometimes we, and maybe even they, misunderstand. For example, some cringe whenever it is said that Mary is the mother of God. And some say, well, I, you know, I don't know about, about that. We'll say, Je he's, she's the mother of Jesus. She's the mother of Christ, but we don't want to say she's the mother of God. Can I say to you, that the early church in council said that is the way that we talk about Mary because they are defending the orthodox faith against those heretics around them. They are defending the very faith that we proclaim whenever we confess our faith in the Nicene Creed. That he is truly God of truly God. It's the very thing we sing at Christmas. Veiled in flesh the Godhead seed. Hail the incarnate deity. Throughout the year we sing amazing love. How can it be that thou my God shouldst die for me? That is what that whole title is all about. To say to us, no, Jesus isn't just human. He is fully God. That's why they do that. Sometimes some claim that uh, Mary remained a virgin her whole life. Until she died. And, and some uh, say, no, that's not true. Jesus had brothers. Whether it's... Relations like cousins or brothers, the translations often as brothers. And so, no, she didn't. She had other children with Joseph, some will say. But it might surprise you to know, first of all, whether you believe that she remained a virgin the whole time or not, your salvation is not dependent upon that. Second of all, you might be surprised to know that 
Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, believed that she remained a virgin. John Calvin, our spiritual forefather, John Wesley, believed that she continued to remain a virgin. The point of that is not that you have to call Mary Mother of God. You don't have to. It, the point of that is not to say that you have to believe that she was ever a virgin. You, you don't have to believe that if you don't want to. But the point is this. The point is don't let anybody make you afraid of embracing Mary. She is a great example to us. And one of the interesting things is that nearly every icon that you see painted of Mary holding Jesus, nearly every one is painted in such a way that she is pointing us to Jesus. Follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate him. And so with that in mind, what does this story tell us about the one who will become Mary's child? What does it tell us about the one whose birth we're about to celebrate in just a few hours? It tells us that the one who will be born to Mary will be named Jesus. Church, that is great good news. You see, the name Jesus is not just the name that is above every name. It's not just the name that, as we sang today, every knee will bow at that name and every tongue will declare that He is Lord. But the truth of the matter is, the thing we need to recognize is that the name Jesus means God saves. The reason that we celebrate Christmas is a Savior has come. As important as it is to be around family at Christmas. Now, I, I like to be around family at Christmas. My wife might look at me strange because I like to be alone a lot. But I like to be around family at Christmas. This past Friday, we spent Christmas with my in-laws. We had a great time. Tomorrow, we'll spend Christmas at my mom's house. We will have a great time. And it is great to have all of our kids at Christmas time. See, Sarah and Dakota are married now, so they don't live with us. And we be thankful for that, too. But anyway, and, and Matthew is away at college, you know. But uh, it's good to have the kids back home. For Christmas. But as important as it is to be with family at Christmas, can I say to you, family is not, it is not the most important thing about Christmas. It's not the primary thing about Christmas. I, I, as much as I enjoy parties and food, can I say to you, parties and food, that's not what Christmas is primarily about. And as much as I, I really like presents, you know, who doesn't like presents? I like presents. But can I say to you, Christmas is not primarily about presents. Christmas is about the fact that a Savior has come. Now, I know in our world, there are many who don't know that. There are, there are those who don't know what Christmas is about. There are some who know that it's about the birthday of Jesus, but they don't really know that it's about the fact that a Savior has come. Uh, in fact, it is just kind of normal in our society for people not to even realize that we need a Savior. And that's because the darkness of sin has blinded us so, so that we don't know that we need a Savior. But church, let me tell you, if it weren't for the coming of a Savior, there would be no celebration of Christmas. And I don't mean to say by that, that that without Jesus, Christmas would only be about family or only about parties and food or only about presents or, or only about Santa and the reindeer and those kinds of things. That, that without Jesus, it would just be a secular kind of holiday. I don't mean that. I mean, without the coming of a Savior, there would be no Christmas. We need to understand that. The reason that there is a celebration is because we have all been separated from God, lost in our sins with no way back to our Creator and our Father. We have all been in a state of spiritual death. But at Christmas, we rejoice that a Savior has come, the one who can free us from sin, restore us to a right relationship with our Father, the, and breathe into us new life, life abundant and life eternal. It is this babe in a manger who would eventually suffer and die for us on the cross, taking our sins and our guilt upon himself. It's the same one who would triumph over death on the third day in order to give to us new life. 
And he is the one who, having ascended back to the Father's right hand, has poured out the same Holy Spirit who overshadowed Mary. He has poured the same Holy Spirit out upon all of us who have placed our faith in him and been born anew of water and the Spirit through holy baptism. The angel tells Mary that this child will be great. And he will be called Son of the Most High. Later in our text we're told that he will be holy and he will be called Son of God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit would come upon Mary and the power of the Most High would overshadow and she would conceive and bear a son. The image that we are getting there is the same kind of image where the Shekinah glory of God, the cloud of God's glory overshadowed the tabernacle and overshadowed and filled the temple at the dedication of the temple and permeated that. Here we get the very same image of the glory of God, the Holy Spirit Himself overshadowing and filling Mary. And unlike what some pagans claim, I will tell you, you will get this from some atheists and you will get this from pagans. But unlike what the pagans will claim, this story is not based upon a pagan myth where the gods come down and father those who will be kind of half gods, kind of like, you know, Hercules or in the DC universe it'd be Wonder Woman now, you know. It's not like that at all. Can I tell you that? Be clear, as John Nolan has rightly said, those pagan myths are operating with a completely different train of thought and worldview. Any similarity between the Christian faith about Jesus' virgin birth and these pagan myths is only based on a very superficial scanning of our text today. But rather, it is by the power of the Holy Spirit, like the glory of God in the temple, that the Messiah, who has always been from eternity, came to be born of a virgin. This child whose birth we celebrate is true God, <coughs> the very Word of God, who was with God in the beginning, and who was God, became flesh. And as such, he is descended from David, the great king, through his mother Mary, and also through her, his legal father, Joseph. He is the one that the prophets foretold would be the Messiah. He would be the one whose kingdom would have no end. And through Jesus, that kingdom has come near to us. At Christmas, we celebrate that fact and we continue to pray for and long for the day when the kingdom will come in all of its fullness. In the meantime, we celebrate the fact that through faith in Jesus, the Savior of the world, we can enter into that very kingdom and live as kingdom people in the here and now. What news the angel brought to Mary? And how did Mary respond the news that the angel brought to her young 13 year old girl that she was how would we respond how would you respond if the angel just showed up you know how would you respond to this kind of news once again the blessed version sets us an example and, and it kind of reminds me of, of Paul's letter to Timothy where he says to Timothy let no one look down upon you because of your youth so here we have this young girl. Don't look down upon her because of her youth. But, but she sets for us this example. In verse 38, Mary says, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Folks, that is great faith. That is great trust. Church, this is the way that we should all respond to whatever it is that God calls us to. So often... We fight and we argue and we try to come up with a rationale and reason our way out of whatever it is that we think God is calling us to. Perhaps it's something we think that whatever it is that God's calling us to, I, I can't do that. I don't have the gifting for it. I don't have the talent for it. I don't have the know-how to do it. Somebody else can do it, but I can't do it. It would be impossible for me to do that. But uh, the angel reminds Mary, your cousin, Elizabeth, who in her old age was said to be barren, has conceived a son. Because you see, <coughs> nothing shall be impossible with God. Church, let's be like Mary. Let us place our trust in the Lord. And let us celebrate the one who is the Savior 
of the world, the one whose story began a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Son.